the scope of Eco2 is actually pretty well defined. It's pretty simple. So we have to find out whether CO2 will leak out of subseabed CO2 storage sites. So what is the likelihood of leakage and what are the possible pathways? And on the other hand, we have to um, investigate what the impacts would be. So how severe would be the impact if leakage would occur? What would be the impact on the marine ecosystem, especially at the seabed? How bad would the damage be if CO2 comes out of these storage sites? One of the big advantages of the EU project is that we can tap on all the different expertises and resources and instrumentation that is available in different European countries. So to set up a really um, cutting edge field program, for example, investigating all these sites uh, that we look at, we need a lot of different instrumentation and techniques, very advanced techniques. And there's no signal institute at Europe that has all, all, all of these facilities. So we have to team up and bring together the best instrumentation that we have. And the same thing applies to people and their expertise. My name is Melis Celatoğlu. I'm working in the National Oceanography Center in Southampton. And I'm involved in the geophysics part of the eco project. With the geophysical methods, especially we use tile resolution seismics and site scan sonars to work out the slab area to try to see if there is any gas leakage pathways. From the slab nerve, basically there is no active leakage of carbon dioxide. I mean, the main, I think that the most important uh, finding is the presence of the sphygal fracture, which is 25 kilometers of the injection site. And then that fracture basically is around three kilometers long and it's active. Basically, there is lots of fluids coming from that fracture. I mean, including formation fluids and gas, including methane. My name is Alike Stephen O'Brien, and I conducted uh, the legal research on behalf uh, in ECO2 on behalf of the University of Trier. Ultimately, this uh, this technology is in the beginning quite difficult to grasp. It's very complex, very technical, um, and also the impacts in the beginning. The scientists themselves were not really clear. What are the outcomes? What are the potential impacts of CCS? So that was a bit of a challenge sometimes to translate the scientific knowledge into a legal framework and um, because the disciplines work very much different. We all were aware that we are working in an interdisciplinary research project and that you need to maybe step away from your own discipline and think differently because in the end it is about translating scientific information into a sort of environment protection standard framework that is then, um, that, that, that demonstrate the acceptability of risk or not. I'm uh, Tamara Baumberger. I'm working at the Center for Geobiology at the University of Bergen in Norway. And in the ECO2 project, I am working on the gas and fluid chemistry of natural analog system and also at the storage sites. When we are talking about geochemistry, it's mostly basically fluids and gases that are interacting with the seafloor. Already on board, we were checking for the chemistry, basically, of these bubbles. So we wanted to know what is the main ingredient of that. We see, oh, it's high CO2 and it has this and this uh, footprint in the isotopes. We kind of can track back where it came from and which reactions it did with the rocks or the sediments. My name is Elizabeth Morgan and I was one of the marine biologists on the ECO2 project and I looked at the, the first signs that the respiratory response um, was going to be suffering from increases in um, acidification. Um, so if the animals were unable to adequately respire. And then we also combine that with looking at the immune response. Were these organisms going to become more susceptible to diseases as a response of increases in CO2? If we can get a really good understanding of um, 
what species are the most vulnerable, what species are the most resilient within the same community. We can start to build an understanding of how communities as a whole will um, react to a CO2 leak. So my name is uh, Lisa Fielstetter. I'm from Geomar in Kiel. And um, a key part of my research in ECO2 was to figure out what happens if CO2 leaks from the storage formation into the water column. When CO2 leaks into the water column, it will dissolve. And when it dissolves, um, the water will become acidified. I developed a, a plume dispersion model, actually. So we can predict the dispersion of leaking CO2. The main conclusion is um, that the impact of, of a CO2 leak is limited to the bottom waters and also to a small area around the lake because the currents dilute the elevated pCO2 waters very quickly. My name is Nara Ahmed and I work with the DNVGL and our main task um, in the ECO2 project was uh, uh, developing the environmental risk management methodology. We developed a model that gives you a comprehensive methodology that can be then used for future CCS projects. What I enjoyed about the ECO2 project was the opportunity it gave um, for a lot of people from different disciplines to come together. Um, we met every year in a huge consortium, and that allowed us to share uh, the different work that we've been doing on, on this topic, um, something that we all feel very passionately about. It was great to see everyone come together and kind of maintain the enthusiasm around this project throughout the four years. If you talk about CCS technology in general, so there are basically the opponents that say, who say that this is extremely dangerous, it should never be done. And then there are others from the, maybe from other sides who say, oh, there's no risk at all. These are kind of the extremes that we have in the political debate in Europe. And we put more natural science realism to all that debate. I think we showed that there are structures in the overburden above storage sites where leakage may occur. There's a lot of uncertainty still, a lot of new open questions. So how permeable are these chimneys really? And then we could show using mostly natural analogs that if leakage would occur, the rates would be low, the footprint would be very small and the impact would be limited. So that's a very different picture. It's much more realistic 